Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> welcome to this roundtable discussion, a discussion on a food systems uh, approach to transforming Africa's soil health. We look into policies, science, implementation, and impact. Um, we have a panel today, a very distinguished panel. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Makandawiri. He is the African Director of the Alliance for uh, African Partnerships and the Chairperson of the Malawi National Planning Commission. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Mukandawiri. We then thank have uh, nobody less than Dr. Ratan Lal. He is the World Food Prize Laureate of 2020 and Professor of Soil Science at Ohio State University. Thank you, Dr. Lal, for being with us. Then we have Dr. Umu uh, Kamara. She is the Regional uh, Director uh, North and West Africa for IFDC. Thank you, Umu. We were supposed to have Julie Borlock, the granddaughter of the Nobel Prize laureate, of course, Dr. Norman Borlock. Unfortunately, uh, she could not make it this morning. Um, I myself, um, good morning, nice meeting you. I'm Prem Min Rabin. I'm a program director of a program called uh, Fertilizer Research and Responsible Implementation uh, in Ghana. I will facilitate uh, the conversation today. Um, there will be an opportunity for you as participants to ask questions. Um, you can type them in, uh, in the chat. Uh, I also like to uh, introduce Constance, Constance um, Muyem Yembe. Um, she will be moderating today's event. Um, uh, Constance is currently an, an Atlas Corps Fellow and former <coughs> Mandela Washington Fellow. Um, with that, I would like to start off with a slight presentation. Um, um, to introduce the discussions. Okay, um, buckle up, I'll run through this quickly. Uh, it's just an introduction on soil health strategies uh, for sustainable food systems uh, in Africa. One thing that we see uh, unfortunately happening is an enormous expansion of the crop area on the African continent. The red lines go up, uh, it almost doubled in the past uh, 40, 50 years, while in uh, Europe and Northern America, developed countries, we see that the cropping area actually is going down. Now, <clears throat> this increase uh, has uh, disadvantages. It leads to loss of biodiversity, degradation of the soils, uh, loss of greenhouse gas emissions um, because of the composition of our soil organic matter. And we can lose even up to 50% when we clear our lands. Um, <clears throat> the issue is that, uh, uh, let's say, the, the clearing of the land contributes much more to greenhouse gas emissions uh, equal to fossil fuel use on the African continent rather than agriculture per se. So land clearing is a real issue. So um, how does all this happen? Um, um, the yields are increasing in um, uh, European and American countries. And what you see is that the yields um, remain almost virtually unchanged on uh, the Western and Eastern African uh, regions that we have plotted here. Um, all this tends to relate to fertilizer use. Uh, the green lines are again uh, Europe and uh, the United States. Um, in the mid 80s, there were some interventions in Europe, so the fertilizer use uh, decreased, but it's still uh, in the order of 150, 100, 150 kilograms per hectare of NPK. And the fertilizer use, the red lines in West Africa, East Africa, African continent is at 10, 20 kg per hectare. How does it relate to yield? You can look at the yellow line, which is the maize yields on uh, the, in Northern America. <clears throat> um, the blue line are the yields on uh, uh, the European continent. And you can see uh, the decline in fertilizer use here. But overall, with increasing fertilizers, we see an increasing uh, yield. The African continent, Eastern and Western Africa are somewhere down here. Um, expanded, you can see indeed that fertilizer application and yield are somewhat related, but again, we are somewhere uh, around zero over here. So um, this keeps our yields uh, very low. Now, the high yields uh, and the high use of fertilizers and other inputs in developing countries, uh, along with the e uh, drivers of economies of scale, have led to all these large scale uh, production systems like these mega farms in, uh, in Brazil, we have all these mega stables with uh, chicken and, and uh, pig pr production. Um, it uh, leads to uh, cheap food 
and uh, we end up with problems like obesity. So we kind of see a, a movement um, uh, in the Western world, primarily uh, a global dialogue on agriculture system, whereby going back to nature where small is beautiful, the feel good is actually dominating. So we have systems like organic agriculture that rejects the use of agrochemicals. We have dialogues on uh, agroecological approaches. Um, basically, they want to change the entire societal structure um, uh, and changing the production system. Also, not using agrochemicals or at least minimizing them, but the discourse tends towards rejection, rejection of, these, uh, of these inputs. Recently, we have uh, regenerative agriculture. Generally, these are large tracts of lands with long-term that are needed. Um, <clears throat> overall, the yields on this production are generally lower per hectare, which means that you need more land. Um, the losses from uh, organic manure or fertilizers are basically comparable to mineral fertilizers. Land require, labor requirement is double or even more than double and these systems need to be subsidized uh, to be economically viable. But these are the dialogues uh, generally coming from developed nations because of the concerns of food chiefs, large scale production systems, obesity, etc. But how does this relate um, to the African systems? There seems to be quite a mismatch. We don't have these enormous uh, land, uh, large scale production systems on the African continent, and it's rather a completely different dialogue. So let's go back to basics. <clears throat> um, not using inputs, for instance, uh, could become a very serious issue. So this is a maize crop uh, grown under rain-fed conditions without fertilizers. We see a pale maize crop, and um, here we have added fertilizers. And basically what we see is that it is due to the lack of nutrients that this crop was not growing. So um, <clears throat> fertilizers are food for, for our uh, plants uh, to increase the yields um, and feed the people. This is an example of the nutrient balances. Um, this is um, um, Western uh, Germany, for instance, where the input of um, nutrients and the outputs of nutrients basically balance out positively, meaning that we introduce more nutrients into the system than comes out of the system. Uh, while in Tanzania, uh, actually, there is a depletion of nutrients, which is negative uh, here at about 27 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. And this is true basically for the entire African continent, where we see a lot of degradation, uh, a lot of nutrient depletion, uh, resulting in actually uh, reducing rather than increasing yields. So what are the characteristics of the African systems? It's small scale. There's enormous pressure on land, uh, continuous cropping. Um, we have agronomic practices with very low use of external inputs. We see burning of crop residues, limited uh, organic uh, manure is available, very low use of fertilizers. And uh, we have this enormous expansion of agricultural land to meet the growing needs uh, of, of our people. 80% of the food volume increase comes from expansion of agriculture land rather than from yield increase. Now, clearly, <clears throat> all that leads to soil degradation, loss of biodiversity, emissions of greenhouse gases, hunger and poverty, and even societal uh, instability. So clearly, this is not a viable path of development. We will have to enhance and work on the soil fertility of, of the systems on the African continent. Soil organic matter is really key and essential. Its buildup is slow, but we must work on it. Uh, it's important to boost the efficiency of the fertilizers that are used. It's important to boost the efficiency of water that is used. One thing we, that we uh, tend to forget is that carbon sequestration comes with the sequestration of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, for instance. This is plant material that has to be put back into the soil, and it comes with all these additional nutrients as well. Soil pH is another uh, very important driver uh, that we could um, uh, improve, um, um, but only when it's really very low and it's a costly business uh, to lime. These are probably the two most important soil fertility properties, and apart, of course, from soil physical, environmental, and uh, genetics. Let me add one dimension to it. Fertilization is not just needed for yield increase. Uh, these are soils with limited sink availability, for instance, and these are countries where uh, humans 
have uh, zinc deficiencies. And you look at the patterns, they look quite similar. So there is also this very strong relation between plant nutrition and human health. Um, in this graph, you can see that after the Second World War, when we pushed up our yields, we basically decreased the concentrations of zinc and copper and iron in our produce. So when I eat 100 grams of maize today, I may get only half the amount of zinc that I did when I would eat it in 1960, um, which is uh, nutritionally, of course, not such a great idea. And this is just not just true for grains, it's also true for uh, other fruits and vegetables as well. And we can do something about it, for instance, with smart fertilization um, to uh, increase those nutrient uh, concentrations. We call that agronomic uh, fortification. Now, fertilizers themselves are essential, but there's one dimension I would like to add to it, which is water. Um, basically, <clears throat> fires water through its stomata. When it's wide open, uh, water transpires out of the plant, but at the same time, carbon dioxide comes in. The carbon dioxide is needed for the growth, which means that when it's wide open, we have high transpar uh, trans. Uh, um, transpiration and we have high inflow when it's closed it all goes down so basically there is a linear relation between water consumption water used by plants and photosynthesis unfortunately if um, the plant has limitations of nutrients for instance then this relation drops so um, it reduces the use efficiency of actually everything and it further gets repressed with additional problems in practice it looks like this we see a similar pattern um, all these dots over here imply that there are other factors that affect the yield. Um, same thing with rainfall. This is another location. Um, you see the same pattern happening here, which means that in case of rainfall, we should prevent runoff. But in addition to all that, we have to work on fertilization and good agronomic practices. So water and nutrients really go uh, hand in hand, which means that we have to combine integrated soil fertility management with soil and water conservation practices. Um, we need a landscape approach because um, having interventions at uh, just uh, a farm level will not do the trick. You will need communities, you will need people along, let's say, a watershed to uh, integrate, to uh, align their activities so that we have a uh, large impact. Soil and water conservation is something that cannot be done just at the farm level. So um, we need these integrated approaches, uh, integrated farm, uh, communal and uh, regional um, uh, interventions uh, that have to be combined, um, apply integrated soil fertility management and soil water conservation. We need in situ production of manure, transporting all this manure is a very costly business if it's available at all. Um, and uh, we need smart fertilization that needs to be crop and site specific in order to improve yields, to improve the nutritional quality and uh, uh, plant health and resilience. We need an agricultural uh, revolution in Africa. It must be uniquely uh, African. Um, there should be an African voice probably in the global food systems dialogue to counter the current uh, discussions or to tune it to African needs. Um, it should be clear that um, soil health uh, is not solely a responsibility of the farmers to take care of. Everybody benefits, uh, multiple actors, we benefit from it by eating the produce of the fruits. So somehow um, uh, we should also contribute um, to generate value for soils so that farmers can make that investment. Um, <clears throat> so the question is how we can feed uh, the African population in a sustainable way. And I would like to uh, leave it up to the panel to discuss all, all that. Um, so from here on, I would like to ask Constance. Uh, Constance, could you join us and um, um, ask the questions to the panels? Thank you so much, Prem. Good day to you all, and thank you again for attending this panel. Ladies and gentlemen, the current global discourse on sustainable agriculture and food systems is dominated by developed nations and focuses on organic, regenerative, and agroecological practices. These dialogues meet the needs of the US and of European nations, but do they serve African nations' diverse agricultural and food systems? 
So can I invite Dr. Umu to start addressing this uh, question? Yes, thanks, Prem. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for the opportunity to take part in this very important discussion. Uh, let me start by saying that the current global discourse on sustainable agriculture and food systems is not a new one. It's a new name to a debate that I started decades ago on alternative agriculture, organic farming, low input sustainable agriculture. It has always started out of concern that our natural resources are limited and we need to think of better ways and means of farming. Now, is it a pertinent discussion for Africa? And um, I think, yes, absolutely. We do have limited resources and resource degradation is a critical concern for African nations. Uh, the other pertinent question is, can organic agriculture alone generate the yield increases needed to achieve food security in Africa, to feed over 1.3 billion people, 27% of which are food insecure. Now, there's been hundreds of studies in this area on the subject, and those studies have shown that although organic agriculture can make a significant contribution to food security, it is not enough alone in itself because yields in organic agriculture tend to be 20% lower than conventional yield. There is no one-size-fits-all solution to achieving food security in Africa, but a mix of systems. Basically, the best combination to maximize nutrient availability to the crop, to improve crop response, to minimize nutrient losses and environmental degradation. So I would say that we need in Africa an integrated approach an integrated and participatory approach to soil fertility management, an approach that combines organic and inorganic, as well as traditional methods of soil conservation that are adapted to local social economic com conditions. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, Dr. Lal, uh, would you want to build on to this uh, remark? Uh, I fully agree with what she said. Um, what is needed is integrated soil fertility management. Uh, that is absolutely correct. <clears throat> we should try to do as much recycling as we can, but uh, if there is a negative nutrient budget, uh, it must be supplemented by chemical fertilizers, uh, judiciously, prudently. And that fertilizer is not only the NPK, uh, also the macronutrients, especially the macronutrient part. Um, I would like to mention though that as much as possible, we must recycle biomass because uh, soil organic matter content of soil just have become very low. And uh, biomass can only be built, uh, organic matter can only be built if we return biomass uh, back to the soil. And uh, we recognize that farmers need crop residue for other purposes such as feeding cattle or uh, many other household uses, uh, I think we must make the provision that uh, crop residue is returned as much as possible. That is how soil health will improve over time and soil can become disease suppressive. So integrated soil fertility management, yes, that should be the motive. And uh, based on the possibility to build soil health, uh, in general through improvement of soil organic matter content. Uh, I might mention one more part that um, when we talk about nutrient, uh, please don't forget that nutrient availability and efficiency also depends on soil physical properties as well. So if the physical property, especially soil temperature, drought stress, compaction, crusting, uh, erosion, if these problems are not taken care of, even when you apply inputs, uh, they are wasted. So integrated soil fertility management and the overall improvement in soil health, physical, chemical, biological, is really the key to break the yield stagnation that we saw how much yield difference is between the US, North America, Europe, and Africa, East and West both. That yield gap 
uh, to me is not only just the lack of fertilizer, is also degradation of soil health. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Makanda Weary. Um, uh, can we combine the discussion? Um, there seems to be a need for, let's say, more Africa-oriented approaches rather than the global discussions. How do you think um, we could guide the global discussions, that global discourse in a way um, that there is more attention for the specific situation of the African continent rather than, you know, having all these um, systems imposed on the African countries, for instance, by donors, etc. And how could we address the topics that Dr. Lal uh, mentioned um, um, and have influence on guiding investments in soil health on the African continent? Yeah, thank you, Prem. Um, I, I think first and foremost, uh, as you rightly said, I think uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, you know we pursue a uniquely African green revolution. Uh, at the same time, we need also to take into account uniquely national, uh, you know, green revolutions, uh, you know, because Africa is not uh, a country, it's a continent. Uh, you, you have, uh, you know, varied, uh, you know, ecological zones and, uh, uh, and uh, agriculture farming systems vary very considerably. Um, so it is critical, therefore, that, uh, you know, we really tell uh, some of these uh, global conversations to the unique circumstances of uh, the millions of smallholder farmers within, uh, you know, Africa. You know, uh, most of these uh, smallholder uh, farmers are very poor resourced in terms of land availability. Uh, that's why they continue uh, to exploit uh, their small parcels of land every year. They continuously mine it. Uh, by, you know, uh, getting uh, the little nutrients available uh, to the extent that, uh, indeed, for many countries in East and Southern Africa, they have very starving soils. Uh, 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 and what we do then? Um, I think uh, the first thing is, of course, um, you know, we need to generate, you know, knowledge around those specific, uh, you know, circumstances of those, uh, you know, countries. Do we have a full understanding of those uh, farming systems? Do we have a full understanding of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the role of women uh, in farming, uh, young people who are coming in? Do we have an understanding of our newcomers, uh, particularly the emerging of these uh, commercial farmers? Uh, maybe it is those commercial farmers who have got the capital, they've got the access to technology that might actually begin uh, to really begin uh, adopting some of these more intensive and uh, uh, to uh, advanced technologies uh, linked to soil management and soil health. Uh, so I think that understanding of uh, the unique uh, environments is absolutely fundamental. Uh, but I think beyond that, I mean, going back to, um, you know, what the global community needs to appreciate is that uh, within Africa, the African uh, governments have defined their own frameworks um, you know, we have uh, the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development uh, Program, which is actually the blueprint for enhancing agriculture productivity and food security in Africa. And to what extent uh, are these uh, global conversations take into account uh, these uniquely African uh, defined frameworks? Because it's within the context of those African uh, frameworks that, uh, you know, the African leaders will begin to commit themselves to matters uh, linked to soil health and soil fertility. Uh, it is uh, within the context of those uh, frameworks that uh, they will actually commit themselves to investments um, in the agriculture sector. Uh, and uh, there's no question uh, at all that, uh, you know, one of the most uh, pressing challenges, particularly for African governments, is really to invest uh, beyond just a fertilizer. Uh, you, know, um, you know, but do they have enough scientists and did Professor Lar, I mean, who is, um, you know, a, a globally renowned soil scientist, uh, needs to be challenged. I mean, to what extent are, you know, eminent colleagues, scholars like these, paying attention to mobilizing a new crop of African scientists that are, can really begin to be supportive of uh, that transformation that is required, that, you know, transformation which uh, uh, is linked to building a resilient uh, soil health program for each of the countries okay. uh, we're dealing with. 
Um, Dr. Lal, this, this framework um, that Dr. McConaughey is talking about, how would it look like uh, agrotechnically speaking? What would be different compared to all the dialogues on regenerative uh, agriculture, on organic agriculture, etc.? So, um, how would that look like, such a framework? I uh, think I first fully agree with what Richard said. Uh, we need uh, uh, highly trained African uh, scientists, uh, trained under the local conditions where the problems are. Uh, let me give you an example. When I joined in 69, in 14 countries I was working in West Africa, there was only one soil physicist with an MSc degree. And uh, things have improved since then, uh, but compared to uh, so many countries, so many ecoregions, so many diverse biophysical, socioeconomic conditions, uh, the three components of research teaching extension uh, are still weak and they need to be strengthened. And they need to be strengthened uh, uh, with the view that the scientists uh, in agriculture working in Africa of African origin who understand the culture, local customs and traditions, uh, they are respected and rewarded appropriately. Uh, that reward system is very important uh, so they know that they are. And the other part I would really like to uh, suggest uh, each country within each ecoregion, for example, Sahel, uh, humid part of Africa, the uh, sub-Saharan part, the highlands, there must be a periodical every five year maybe, uh, a report on state of the soil health. That information, uh, yes, soil map has been produced for Africa, uh, some of it is on a very large scale, <laughs> one in a thousand or so. But I'm talking about state of the soil health, uh, the status of soil degradation by erosion, compaction, nutrient depletion, uh, whatever other salinity, whatever other causes, a, a very systematic, uh, properly organized state of the soil health at least once every five years. Uh, U.S. started this in 1987, uh, state of soil conservation in the U.S., and every five years, they have been predicting the rate of soil erosion by water and wind compaction, soil quality. I think that is required. And it should be uh, done, as I said, not only on national basis, but eco-regions, because eco-regions sometimes cut across uh, so that every five years you can see what the trend. And if uh, UNCCD says that we want to achieve land degradation neutrality, then that state of the soil health map will tell us where we are going, where we are weak, where the trend is upward. That, I think they should negotiate with FAO, with USAID, with other organizations. The work should be done by African scientists, but <coughs> support, uh, funding support, and other hopefully can come from somewhere else. Um, I fully agree with ISFM. I only want to mention uh, the landscape. I think, Prem, you mentioned also uh, landscape uh, adoption of technology. I understand what it means. Uh, I know farmers in Ohio and other elsewhere in Midwest who are 2,000 acres, 5,000 acres. I know one farmer, 10,000 acres. So landscape adaptation of technology for the 10,000 acres, what should be grown on the upper part of the hill, what should be grown on the middle slope, what should be grown on the foot slope, uh, what should be grown on north facing slope, south. Okay, excellent. Now let's take care of, think about the case of farmers who are two acre, half acre, one acre. And within one landscape from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill, there may be 100 farmers. Whom are you going to sell? What part of landscape they should do where? So please think about it. Simply using a terminology without realizing the on the ground biophysical and human dimension issue. Supposing you have a farmer who has only land on the upper part of the hill. <coughs> you tell them you should be growing here uh, low land uh, bottom rice. It is it, not appropriate. So I think we have to be very careful. Yes, landscape uh, is an excellent idea. 
and there may be some farmers in Kenya, Rhodesia, elsewhere, where they do have a large land area and where it applies. But when there are majority of our farmers are half acre, one acre, they have a piece here, piece there. We have to think about what that concept means in their context. That, that's, that's very important. Yeah. The other part I'd like to mention is that we should uh, really reward farmer for if they adopt better management practices. That the only incentive uh, farmers who adopt improved practices, this improve soil health, they increase ecosystem services, which help not only them, but the entire world community, climate change mitigation, biodiversity, water quality, everything, they should be rewarded appropriately, fairly, justly, transparently. Uh, that is a very important part. Thank you. Moving on to question two, given the over exploitation of soils on the African continent, which leads to soil nutrient mining, declining crop yields and poverty, what comprehensive or integrated approaches must be pursued to reverse these trends? I'll ask Dr. Lau to start answering that question. Soil degradation is the major cause why the Green Revolution bypassed Africa. That, that is a fact. Uh, soils are so degraded. Uh, in 69-70, the average cereal yield was on a continental basis, one ton per hectare. It is now one and a half ton per hectare, continental basis. Yes, there are a few places in Ghana and Kenya, maybe Zambia, uh, Rhodesia, elsewhere, where the yield are two ton, three tons possible. But there are pockets uh, on a continental scale. Uh, it is not. So we have to find out why has the Green Revolution bypassed? Why? And uh, you will find uh, it is the degradation of soil. Varieties uh, have been given, but the improved varieties cannot perform miracle if the soil does not have uh, uh, enough uh, soil quality and health. Water is but drought is going to be a very big problem. In Asia, irrigation uh, India, China, uh, India alone has 70 million hectare of irrigation. China has even more than that. Uh, Africa, uh, very small, 10% of the total uh, arable area is hardly irrigated. Yet there is a potential for expanding irrigation. And if irrigation is done in Africa, it should be drip based, sub fertigation, uh, more modern rather than flood, uh, flood irrigation. Drought is going to be more and more problems. So conserving water, promoting drip sub fertigation, uh, creating positive nutrient budget. Uh, negative nutrient budget has been a problem. So integrated soil fertility management so that we have positive nutrient budget. And please, for whatever else you do, soil organic matter content is a critical ingredient and it's very depleted is depleted because the biomass is taken away from the land. So we must encourage farmer to return the biomass and reward them for doing that. Mm -hmm. Because when they return the biomass, the global community benefits. So we must reward them for doing that. So this is a way in which not only we can address poverty, we can address food and nutrition security, we can address many sustainable development goals of the United Nations. The motives, the slogan is empowering farmers. Uh, and uh, many of them are women farmers, as we know. So providing them the logistics support, providing them the extension services, producing soil quality map every five years. Mm -hmm. I think we will be on a road to progress. We can't hear you, Prem. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to unmute. Can I ask uh, uh, Umu Kamara to also respond to this, um, how we can turn this uh, dialogue into something that's really sensible for the African continent? I mean, Dr. Rao paints a picture where it will be uh, very difficult to uh, improve the soil health. Um, what, what is your take on, on this uh, observation? Thank you, Graham. Uh, and Dr. Lal, thank you for the very comprehensive answer. Uh, one thing that I would just like to underscore is 
the critical need for us to first understand understand why yields are so low. I mean, what types of nutrient deficiencies exist? So we need to understand what is the most limiting nutrient? Is it a primary one, secondary, or micronutrient? So the process must begin, I would say, with full quality soil analysis for us to be able to understand exactly what type of nutrient deficiencies are um, persisting and mapping these deficiencies and soil acidity constraints in order for us to be able to develop an integrated approach to addressing uh, soil health matters on the continent. So I think with that uh, information in hand, we can work with farmers. We absolutely need to work with farmers and the private sector to develop a soil fertility management package, one that is adapted to local social economic com conditions. So I think the process is the adoption of a soil fertility, integrated soil fertility management approach to reverse soil nutrient mining. But it must start with us understanding what types of nutrient deficiencies we have. Thank you, Fern. So moving on to question three. Um, the burden to sustainably manage soils is placed entirely on smallholder farmers. Yet the benefits from soil use are reaped by everyone. Despite private land ownership, soils are a good. Who should bear the responsibility for improving and maintaining soil health? And how does this become sustainable? I'll ask Dr. Kandawi to begin. Yeah, I, I want to go back to what uh, Professor Lar suggested, and I think it's a very important point he raised on uh, the need for ensuring that uh, we have an understanding uh, every uh, so often, maybe every five years or even less than that, on the state of soil health in Africa. Um, you know, uh, and I think this is a responsibility of government to be able to really understand uh, to what extent are their soils degenerating. Um, you know. Uh, if indeed, I mean, if I may use uh, the medical metaphor, that uh, African soils are in the intensive care stage, uh, you know, but we need to demonstrate that, uh, you know, and uh, l let's bring that to the attention of, of African governments on the severity of the deterioration of the state of African soils. Uh, we need shock tactics, you know, uh, to present to the governments that uh, this is actually, you know, uh, a, a really a danger in uh, eroding uh, uh, the sustainability of not just the agriculture sector, but also the, the national economies. I mean, will decline as well uh, because of the decline nature of uh, the health status of their soils. So, so th th that's absolutely critical for national governments to appreciate that because uh, it's not just a small of farmers that are, you know, uh, are, are bound to lose. Uh, it is really uh, the country as a whole. And therefore, um, you know, the um, governments as well as uh, the private sector uh, need to really uh, be innovative and creative. And indeed, I must say, the international community as well, uh, you know, uh, they, they need to find innovative ways, but at the entry point is precisely to shock national governments and indeed the international community, that uh, this is actually, you know, a, a serious, uh, not just a national uh, emergency, uh, but uh, also a global emergency. Uh, and that's why, you know, some of us are very delighted that uh, we're bringing this uh, as part of uh, not just uh, an African conversation, but part of uh, a global conversation, because the global community too, whether it's in terms of uh, fostering more training, uh, of uh, you know soil you know scientists across Africa or indeed uh, uh, investing in uh, those uh, successes that are on the ground and explore how they might be scaled up um, you know so information is going to be extremely critical uh, in, in ensuring that uh, there's commitment by everybody uh, to investing in uh, soil health. Um, Dr. Lau, would you? Dr. Lau, you're muted. Could you no, think of some? some... I, yeah, I might have to leave, so I'll just make one more comment. I, I want to re-emphasize what Richard just said. Uh, if we could divide the continent into ecoregions, 
and many ecoregions will cut across the countries. Uh, for example, a humid climate will be many countries, subhumid climate, mountainous climate. So we produce soil quality map every three years or every five years uh, on the ecoregion basis where many countries within that region are cooperating in developing that map. And we define a methodology. This map is for land use planning and management of soil quality. That's the objective. We want to find out what the trend in soil quality, soil physical properties, organic matter content, macronutrient, micronutrients, how they are changing in the root zone, at least to 50 centimeter depth, if not more. And then also develop how to overcome the soil related constraints for that region. So the map has to be at a planning scale, like one to 10,000 or one to 20,000, no more than one to 50,000. Uh, there is no use uh, having a map of one to 10 million or one to, uh, that, that's simply a, a decoration piece on the wall. It's not a planning map. And that should be really a very high priority and it should be updated every five years. And it should tell what are the constraints for a particular soil type to grow the specific crop that we want to grow in that region. So it's a, actually a tool to plan soil quality for improving productivity and nutritional quality of the continent as a whole. But it should be done on an ecoregion basis. That means many countries which ecoregion cut across. Um, so if you were to go to FAO and say, we need your assistant, the assistance is you help us. Our scientists will do the work. It will be Africa. It is the African scientists who will get the training in doing how to do survey, how to do quantification, how to do interpret the data, how to, but provide us the standardized methodology, any other guidance we need, uh, additional resources required, modern equipment required, map, remote sensing, GIS, whatever. Uh, but the work should be done by African scientists themselves who understand not only the landscape, but the culture and tradition, uh, and because biophysical and socioeconomic part both. I would okay. say that Abuja 2 Summit should come up with that recommendation. That is our guiding tool how to improve soil quality for next 10 year, next 20 year period. Okay, Dr. Lal, before you leave, can I take the opportunity? You talked about rewarding farmers. What mechanisms can you think of, of rewarding farmers? What about uh, carbon, uh, uh, carbon trading, uh, increasing soil organic matter? What are opportunities there? I think there are two parts, which is one is carbon trading because the entire global community will benefit if farmers can sequester carbon in soil and trees. So paying them, the question is payment, how much? And that is a very critical part. It must be the fair price, which is equal to the societal value. And what is a societal value? Societal values, if a farmer in Ghana or Zambia or wherever is sequestering one ton of carbon per hectare in his or her farm, it is benefiting the entire global community in climate change mitigation. So the amount of benefit that the global community gets, that the price should be paid to farmer. There are few reports which have assessed the, uh, I published one report, Robert Costanza have published another one, European Union has another one, uh, my report suggests uh, the price of the carbon should be somewhere between 120 to 130 dollar per ton of carbon, which come to about 30 to 25, 30 euro per ton of CO2. And which means if a farmer sequester half a ton per hectare, they should be paid about 60 dollar per hectare per year. So international community through African Development Bank perhaps, uh, to other organization should reward farmer in such a way that at least 90% of the money should go directly to the farmer, not to the intermediary. It, many times it's the intermediary who benefits much more than the farmer. The reward must go to the farmers. That's a very important part. So developing a very transparent, very fair, very just system to reward farmer and when we do that, when we then the farmers know that we respect them, 
uh, for them to do what we are asking them to do, they will bring about the transformation very quickly. They are the one who have to actually take into action the recommendation and we must reward them. If we don't reward them, unfortunately, we'll be suffering even 10 years from now the same problem. Good, thank you very much, Dr. Lal. I wish you could stay on much longer. Uh, it's a clear answer. I think that's something that should be uh, done uh, about. Um, um, you can stay on, would love to. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Makanda Wery uh, the same question. You talked about uh, policy to support farmers uh, to set uh, the stage information. Dr. Lal talked about carbon sequestration. Would you can can you think of other mechanisms whereby, let's say, consumers uh, or actors in the value chain end up supporting farmers uh, to make long-term investments? Because economy has this tendency of short-term uh, exploitation, while soil health maintenance is a long-term endeavor. So, can you also think of some mechanisms? And after Richard, I would ask Umu the same question. Well, as somebody who works in uh, the policy space, um, let me say that, uh, you know, uh, we need, I think, uh, particularly our colleagues I mean, who are soil scientists, need uh, to uh, deeply engage policy uh, uh, analysts. Uh, because uh, one of the greatest uh, challenges we continue to confront uh, in Africa is uh, the tendency to really simply focus on a subsidy, fertilizer subsidies. Uh, fertilizer subsidies and maybe a little bit of a seed subsidy uh, to the exclusion of uh, equally critical, um, you know, um, uh, investments, focusing on investments in uh, areas uh, like uh, soil management. Uh, this, therefore, uh, I think begs the question on uh, how based do we really convince national governments that, uh, you know, uh, these subsidies, uh, which uh, even exclude uh, in terms of management, uh, the private sector, uh, you know, are really detrimental to the long-term uh, gains in uh, sustaining uh, productivity by member by, by national governments. Uh, so, so we we need, I think, to generate that uh, information and begin to define appropriate policy uh, options. Uh, as we know, I think most of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, subsidies uh, are really used uh, uh, as a uh, a tool for electioneering uh, to mobilize the population to support governments, uh, you know, but how do we, um, you know, uh, convince uh, national governments that are uh, uh, indeed, I mean, this is not the route to take. Um, uh, and one way, I think, again, I would like to challenge our colleagues, uh, both uh, from IFTC and the international community, uh, indeed, development partners uh, who fund most of these programs, that uh, it's critical that uh, we really begin to look at uh, uh, the role of civil society organizations as well as uh, central players uh, in understanding the benefits uh, in investing in soil health. Uh, let them come to the table and let them also be trained uh, on uh, these, uh, you know, uh, soil health uh, uh, benefits uh, in uh, soil health management and, uh, and uh, those other interventions, and indeed exert the necessary pressure on governments to make sure that uh, they pay attention to this mm -hmm. uh, important area that uh, is often neglected. Omo? Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks, Prem. Um, you know, uh, I was thinking about the concepts that Dr. Lalu was discussing, and looking at the questions from the audience as well. And I think one great mechanism that would be a big incentive for farmers would be land ownership. You know, uh, the right to, to own land, the right to farm land. Uh, that could be a big reward system, a big mechanism for um, to incentivize farmers to invest in soil health improvements, uh, in land uh, restoration. So that's, I would think about something, a mechanism that is closer to farmers' incentives, such as land ownership. Thank you. What policy decisions should African and other governments make to build resilient soil health programs that enhance sustainable agriculture productivity and food security? I'll ask Dr. Nkandawiri. 
No, th thank you indeed. Um, that, that's a, a very important uh, uh, question. Um, you know, uh, as I indicated earlier on, I think it is important that, uh, you know, um, national governments uh, take leadership in investing in soil health. Uh, but to be able to do that, uh, we need, I think, to generate uh, sufficient evidence in terms of uh, w w what are the costs of uh, neglecting investments in soil health? What, what are the costs at the national level? Uh, so colleagues I mean, who work in the policy space need to generate that uh, evidence so that national governments appreciate that uh, it is going to be costly uh, in the long run. Uh, more fundamentally, uh, it is important that, uh, you know, uh, governments begin to really uh, look at uh, other target groups uh, in the farming community uh, as a policy option. Uh, you know, I think most of us are not fully aware that, uh, you know, over the past uh, maybe decade or so, we have uh, an emerging uh, uh, group of entrepreneurs, uh, commercial farmers across the continent. You go to Kenya, you go to uh, Malawi, Zambia, you know, I mean, they are, you know, uh, retirees, I mean, whether they're civil servants or they're in private sector, they're really beginning to move into the agriculture sector. Uh, they are actually, you know, have got a, a capital. Uh, th those now need to be targeted uh, as an important uh, group of farmers. It's a policy option that the governments uh, may need to, to look at and say, you know, how do we invest in this group of uh, commercial farmers? Uh, but uh, again, we need to understand even uh, a little more about uh, this particular group of farmers. I think some studies done by Michigan State University indicate indeed that, uh, you know, these are the drivers of our agriculture transformation, um, you know, tomorrow, um, you know, uh, and uh, we need probably to look at them uh, and invest, you know, in those uh, emerging commercial African farmers. Um, but as I said earlier on, I think we need to begin to look at uh, tactics because the bottom line is African governments must take responsibility uh, in investing. Uh, in, uh, you know, soil health. Uh, but beyond that, of course, I mean, we are very keen that, uh, you know, again, I'm speaking as, uh, you know, somebody who was actually uh, running the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, that uh, we need a global community to be part of uh, the voice that exerts pressure uh, on uh, African governments, um, you know, but working with African, uh, you know, uh, institutions, working with uh, African organizations, uh, particularly within the context of the African Union Commission. Uh, it is for this reason that, uh, you know, uh, colleagues from IFDC, colleagues uh, from regional policy research institutions are really now moving behind the uh, fertilizer uh, and soil health summit that uh, <clears throat> is slated uh, to take place in 2022. And uh, again, would like again the global community to, to join us. Uh, we have uh, technical groups that are, are going to be looking at, uh, uh, you know, some of the critical uh, documents and, uh, you know, we will be more than, uh, you know, ready, uh, IFDC uh, and uh, the African, uh, you know, constituencies uh, to really work closely uh, with uh, any of uh, the global players uh, to make sure that uh, we generate sufficient evidence that uh, will convince uh, African governments that, uh, you know, it is time we moved in a different direction by investing in African soils. Okay, so uh, Dr. Umu, um, uh, listening to these last remarks, um, how how could that upcoming conference benefit actually from the UNFSS, um, where the Coalition for of Action for Soil Health emerged as one of the important topics? Yeah, I think um, the current um, discussions on um, food systems kind of put soil health uh, front and center in terms of these priority actions that need to be undertaken and followed up upon. And I think I saw and I heard from Dr. Mackandawir or no, from Julie Howard, that the next step is to uh, for countries to draw agricultural transformation plans and and I think that is that is great. And if it could be based on um, a first step in terms of looking at the cost of inaction, I think we really need to bring the sense of urgency and quantify that urgency. So, what is it 
that is going to, to look like? What would the landscape look like? with no action or slow action, you know, in terms of yields, in terms of nutrient uh, losses. So we need to be able to quantify that that, pro that uh, problem first. And I think both at the regional and national levels, we need to develop regional and soil health improvement strategies as well as national uh, strategies. I know, for instance, ECOWAS has spent the past year developing uh, the regional agriculture input strategy document. And it is it's a great tool. It assesses the current situation, looks at nutrient uh, depletion, soil uh, the, uh, resource degradation um, in the region, and then identifies priority actions to addressing those, const those constraints. So policy actions that can be best um, undertaken by, by regional economic communities but then you also have what Dr. Mwakandawiri was talking about at the national and uh, the national level also. There is a lot that can be done by national governments in terms of the policy area. And of course, at the continental level, you have the Africa Fertilizer Summit, one that put fertilizer on the map. And then you have the second one that um, the team is working on that should really um, to look at the discussion, um, the current debates, and put those issues up um, for consideration for the heads of states and government to really draw an effective action plan. I think the first summit had its, imp its impact, and the second one can even have a greater one. Thank you. Okay, can can I build on? I, I heard a couple of uh, remarks on regions and ECOWAS, etc. Dr. Lal talked about agroecological zoning and soil health. Um, so this goes, let's say, uh, supranational. It goes beyond uh, national plans. Uh, Dr. McCandlewary, um, what about regional approaches? Wouldn't that be a stronger approach? Let's say, uh, like uh, Dr. Kamara said, Umu said, uh, the ECOWAS uh, region, uh, the the SADC region. Uh, would it be? Would that give a stronger voice also to the international community? Uh, would it give a stronger voice? Let's say to um, uh, industry, the fertilizer industry, as a tiny country, um, uh, you use just a little amount of uh, fertilizers, so you have no voice, but as a region, you might have a, a somewhat stronger voice. How do you look at a more regional approach to tackle uh, these issues and to reap the benefits from the, the global dialogues that there are on this coalition? And to also, let's say, as a region, um, um, convince donors not to each and every donor to have its own tiny program, but to come up with comprehensive programs that reach out to regions uh, at large. Yeah, no, thank you, Prem. Uh, I, I think uh, regional economic communities, uh, as you may uh, appreciate, uh, they've been identified as uh, the building blocks for transformation of uh, the African uh, continents. And uh, it's at the regional level that uh, you know, member states discuss uh, the harmonization of a range of uh, policies, uh, including agriculture policies. Uh, for example, um, in ECOWAS, there is a regional uh, agriculture policy uh, framework. Uh, there is also a regional fertilizer policy framework. Uh, in COMESA, there have been uh, discussions in coming up with a, a regional fertilizer policy framework. And uh, it is important that, uh, you know, these uh, regional blocks become uh, a, an important uh, entry point in uh, mobilizing economies of scale and to make sure that uh, uh, the, the impact, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, is broadened uh, in terms of, uh, you know, m member states, um, you know. Uh, and uh, not only that, but uh, beyond that, I think it's about uh, ensuring that, uh, you know, there's a peer learning at the regional level, sharing uh, experiences. Uh, there are countries which have made uh, excellent advances in, uh, you know, the area of uh, soil health, uh, in mapping up their soils um, in some countries. So the need for sharing, uh, you know, knowledge at the regional level becomes important. Uh, we have just been discussing with the Sadaka Executive Secretary, for example, the other day, I mean, on uh, the need for identifying regional centers of excellence, uh, you know, um, which are, can begin to drive, you know, strategic uh, priorities of uh, the region. Uh, and one area, I should say, is really to have a regional center of excellence uh, in uh, driving 
programs around soil health providing capacity uh, so that, uh, you know, uh, countries, let's say in Southern Africa, they go to one important institution, uh, University of Zambia, for example, which uh, has uh, excellent programs uh, on uh, soil health. Um, you know, uh, another one could be actually, you know, a, a, a university that is driving uh, just, you know, new technologies around, uh, you know, uh, soil health related uh, interventions. Uh, so again, you know, the regional level is an important uh, space where you can share resources, where you can uh, begin to also share experiences it is absolutely, you know, critical. And more than that, of course, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, African uh, leaders agree to common positions at the regional level, uh, there's an opportunity there for peer review mechanisms that uh, can be introduced at the regional level to make sure are the countries complying to what they agree upon at the regional level. Um, you know, besides, of course, uh, peer learning, uh, this is extremely critical uh, in ensuring that, uh, you know, the uh, benefits of regional um, you know, blocks, you know, are, are taken advantage of, uh, particular matters linked to, um, you know, uh, supporting uh, the, the growth of, uh, you know, uh, resilient soil health programs uh, at the regional level. Okay, um, I could take a small remark from Umu and then we will uh, move on. Uh, would you have something to, uh, to say on the regional approach, uh, Umu? Uh, yes. There are a few aspects that I wanted to add to what uh, Richard has said, which is absolutely right. So, uh, you know, uh, the regional com economic communities have a, a huge role to play in ensuring that fertilizer moves freely within the region. And so they were given that mandate in 2006. And, and so it, it's critical that they, they keep on implementing uh, that mandate that fertilizer is a strategic commodity without borders and should move uh, freely and they should ensure that trade restrictions are lifted to that regard. Uh, the regional economic communities also are at the first step in terms of um, ensuring that the fertilizer that reaches farmers is of good quality in, in what um, they do in terms of harmonization, uh, fertilizer regulations and legislation. And so that is a huge role that they have to play in, in the region. Um, a, a role that another role that they can play and they, they haven't um, done much so far in this area is to push push member states to adopt um, smart fertilizer subsidy principles. So instead of each country doing its own thing with respect to fertilizer subsidies and crowding out the private sector, uh, it would be great if REX can put that on the table to, to as of this and government for them to commit to the adoption of smart fertilizer subsidy principles and, um, and making sure that it involves the private sector in the design and implementation instead of crowding out the private sector. And I would uh, say another point on this in respect to access to finance. We haven't mentioned that much uh, uh, in this discussion. Um, in the first summit, um, the heads of state called for the Africa Fertilizer Financing Mechanism to be established. And it was one of those, th those instruments, part of the enabling environment, um, the regional environment for the private sector to lead the development of a regional fertilizer market. Now, I think uh, the RECs should play a more proactive role in working with the, the African Development Bank and mobilizing more funding, for more financing for the private sector to be able to play its role in this area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we had a very lively discussion with very many points. I will not try to summarize it, but we, we will uh, be closing off the panel discussion. Of course, please stay on. Uh, we'll take some questions from the audience. We touched upon some agro-technical discussions. We touched upon uh, the global dialogue on food systems and how it does or does not fit the African systems. We talked about the need for uh, um, um, uh, conducive policies. Uh, we talked about regional approaches, to, let's say, to have a stronger voice. Um, we will have a report uh, summarizing some of these. Uh, again, uh, this is not a complete summary of what we discussed, but it would be good to, um, uh, to turn to the audience. So I would like to thank, uh, thank our panelists.
for uh, I think a really exciting uh, topic to discuss with some great uh, suggestions. Um, and um, let's move on uh, to some questions from the audience. Again, please stay on and uh, and let's continue. Um, you know, um, talking alone will not uh, help a lot uh, to to catalyze and improve. Uh, the soil uh, health and, and livelihood and nutrition of our people. So what actions can be taken, okay, to secure these lasting uh, changes? Now, we have a question from um, Mulugeta Beleu. How can we reward farmers who should be leading such efforts? Um, so is there anybody who would like to respond to such a question? Who should be leading such efforts to reward farmers? Anybody raise their hands? So if you want to speak, um, please open your mic. Unfortunately, we cannot do that from a distance, it seems. So please open your mic if you have a remark. Prem Binderman, this is, this is Rob Groot, also from IFDC. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well, Rob. Um, I, I really appreciate the question of, of Mulegeta because it's, uh, and Dr. Lau also brings it up, uh, farmers should be rewarded. Uh, and who should be, well, and, and I would like to say you cannot help anyone specifically or any structure specifically responsible for such a reward. It's a complex situation. Uh, and I'm thinking of what we currently see in, in, in carbon sequestration. Dr. Lal made a very valid remark. Uh, we need to recycle what is taken from the land. Yeah? We need to invest in soil carbon. Currently, there is this global discussion on carbon sequestration. Uh, it's the Western world. Uh, producing uh, carbon dioxide in the air uh, and up to a certain extent it's African farmers that have the possibility to incorporate it in their soils. That could become a reward mechanism if we would be able to measure soil carbon. Uh, it will take another 10 years before we are able to do it. There were suggestions of working on the large scale mapping uh, whatsoever while we need a solution right now. I think to come to a reward system, we need to have parties talk together, talk together about a couple of a limited number of, 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 of clear subjects and the parties that need to talk. It's the government, it's the private sector, it's the research community and above all the private sector that's producing carbon in the air and the farming community that's incorporating this into the soils. Uh, it's not that you can help one party responsible for this reward system, but we need to start a discussion. And there I join uh, my colleague, Dr. Kamara. It's about messaging. It's about creating a sense of urgency. Uh, and I would like to challenge uh, my friend Richard Marcandoweri on this messaging, because as long as we get this flurry of messages that we see coming out of the United States Nations Food Summit, it's not clear what we need to do. And I rather take an approach like Akin Adesina takes, who has five key messages for the continent. Uh, when it comes to, 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 to soil health, um, to fertilizers, can we come to the five questions, the, 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 the five messages that are most important? Is it uh, reward systems for, for soil carbon? Is it land ownership? Is it the fact that organic farming is, is, is not sustainable? What, what are the key messages? Uh, what comes out of the United Nations Food Systems Summit? The messaging is very rich, rich but it's way too much. So Dr. Mulagetta, I, I appreciated your, your feedback because it was focused. What, Richard McAndrewi, can you tell us what would be the key messages to come to a reward system for the farming community? Thank you, Rob. Uh, will Dr. Makanda very respond? Otherwise, I saw somebody raised his hand. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Dr. 
from Canterbury. Oh, I, I thought maybe you wanted uh, the person who has raised his hand to, 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 to speak to that. Um, yes, I, I agree with Rob. I mean, yes, definitely we need, I think, a very focused uh, messages. Uh, we need a reward uh, system, but a reward system that is based on uh, evidence uh, that, uh, you know, this is not a reward system that uh, will just throw money into a bottomless pit like uh, we've seen with uh, subsidies. Um, yes, if uh, there are any subsidies that are, uh, are going to be uh, made available. Uh, let those, uh, you know, look at uh, subsidizing those smallholder farmers who are building, uh, you know, uh, you know, resilience of their soils. I mean, who are really uh, into, uh, you know, soil management practices that are, are likely to enhance agricultural productivity. Uh, so I go back to Europe and uh, other soil scientists that are, you know, um, you know. Um, we need, I think, to join hands and define what kind of uh, soil management practices uh, can be rewarded, and uh, can we pilot that in a, a few uh, selected countries uh, where there's already a movement, where you know smallholder farmers, especially, are beginning to really move into appropriate soil management uh, practices and uh, build an incentive uh, around those uh, practices. Uh, what form and shape should they take? Um, you know, I, I believe uh, the idea of a competition, for example, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, across the country uh, around those farmers who are really moving into uh, appropriate practices can be introduced like it's been done uh, elsewhere. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to build on this. I do see hands, but uh, I have a question from Daniel Panel, who actually built on also what Rob said, he says, would it be beneficial to identify options which are not reliant upon government subsidies, uh, for instance, private sector uh, investments for long term subsidies? Um, it's not necessary just for a panel to uh, to respond. If there is somebody in the audience who could uh, also respond to this question, you're most welcome. Uh, please open your mic and, and you could respond to that. So apart from subsidies, are there other investment mechanisms, for instance, from private sector uh, that could help long-term sustainability investments in soils. I see hands raised. Please open your mic because we cannot control that. Hello, my name is Martin Driscoll. Um, I'd like to just say that I'm working on a project in India at the moment, which replicates a project we worked on in, in uh, China. And this is creating cooperatives, which um, are once funded initially become self-sustaining. So the problem with funding um, organizations is having to throw more money into, an, into a, a hole that just takes more money. They like to see um, something that builds and then is self-sustaining. So the idea of the cooperative gives the farmer ownership of the cooperative. It produces local employment. It, it allows farmers, many small farmers of around one to two hectares, to use reusable containers, so you have less waste going into, into, into landfill. Um, you have um, a better um, option on availability of products or inputs that they can use because you've got a, a bulk coming into the community, it's cutting the, the actual transport cost. And the, the funding is simply to cover the, the initial setup and also the initial inputs for the farmers. So the cooperative, the farmer's own, provides the inputs and the farmers pay the cooperative for those inputs when the, imp when the cooperative that they own buys the crops that they produce. The cooperative employs the local people, it's an equal opportunity, so it, male and female. It um, will clean the produce, it will store the produce. Now storage is very important because the lowest price for any produce is harvest time when everybody is trying to sell. So having cleaned and stored produce, it can be stored for two to three months and sold in batches this gives high revenue back to the farmer. And because it's a large seller, it can sell almost direct to the food producer and cut out a half a dozen different traders in between. So more revenue stays in the community. It becomes a catchment point for information. It allows for the funding of the um, measurement tools that you've mentioned earlier, which an individual farmer can't afford. And it can then um, monitor those that, monitor that. It can analyze um, soils, it can analyze leaves because it has the funding capability as a group. And it tends to work on a, on a basis. So 
it covers a number of the factors you're talking about and also it can be a, a hub for training because when you have a collection together you can then bring trainers in from various different suppliers and from outside from educational units to actually provide training to show farmers how to do better if you have greater diversity in cropping you get better sequestration of carbon you have less wastage so you have less um, um, thorough damage and you also have other options um, to, for the farmers to consider in, in marketing their crops. So that's the option that we work for. And it's a cooperative idea. OK, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, so basically it's um, it's joining forces in a collective uh, to uh, to have a stronger uh, position in, in different aspects uh, in the whole value chain. Uh, yeah. That's an interesting option. Um, I see hands raised, but I cannot see the different people. So is there somebody else who had a remark? Otherwise, I will have a question. Um, now, we have all these development organizations, uh, civil society organizations, wandering around and uh, including IFDC and others trying to impose all these uh, uh, changes and developments. How do you perceive their, their role? Is there a role for them to uh, catalyze a process for um, long-term soil health investment on the African continent? Would there be anybody who could respond to that? Anybody from the audience, otherwise uh, uh, Richard or Umu? <clears throat> it's silent. It means that uh, could mean that uh, civil society has little uh, to do. I still see a hand raised. I still see a hand raised. Um, could you open your mic? Um, let, let me ask Richard. Um, Richard, the role of society, um, several are external to the country, uh, international organizations, several are uh, local, of course. How do you see the role of civil society in pushing for long-term soil health development. Right. Um, in, indeed, it's not just, uh, you know, civil society organizations, but are also, I believe, uh, uh, global uh, organizations uh, or indeed um, global uh, institutions. Uh, it is important that there's a coherence of uh, messages, uh, you know, that are, are actually, you know, receive the consensus uh, at the national level. Th this is why I think, uh, you know, these national frameworks become important that are, you know, the civil society organizations or indeed global institutions uh, begin to speak to nationally defined uh, frameworks uh, as well as uh, nationally defined uh, policies. Um, uh, very fundamental, but uh, this, you know, therefore calls for, you know, a coordinated uh, approach, uh, a coordinated approach uh, in uh, how we address uh, the challenges of uh, soil health as well as uh, fertilizer. Um, you know, therefore, I think the creation of national platforms be becomes extremely important and also the strengthening of uh, the generation of evidence uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, whether they're civil society organizations or whether they're global institutions, they're speaking to available evidence, not, uh, you know, just speaking to their own, uh, you know, uh, interests, uh, or indeed speaking uh, to the interests of the private sector, but speaking to uh, evidence that uh, will genuinely impact uh, on uh, soil health of uh, a given country. Okay. Um, now we actually have an upcoming opportunity uh, with the AU um, uh, Summit on Soil Health uh, as well. So what actions, uh, what uh, can we take to prepare for such, uh, such an event? We, we heard about, uh, let's say, soil, soil quality, uh, soil health mapping. Uh, um, we heard about education. What other pre preparatory actions could we take to make that um, a summit a success with um, follow up <clears throat> of, let's say, actions on the ground? 
I, I think Prema, I mean, I, I, I think uh, as we have learned uh, uh, from our, our colleagues here, as well as uh, from our, our UMA, uh, since uh, the 2006 uh, summit on uh, fertilizer took place, we've seen uh, major changes uh, in the fertilizer space and also in terms of also the generation of new science uh, from, uh, you know, colleagues who are working the uh, soil health, uh, uh, you know, space. And uh, it is therefore important that, uh, you know, this summit, as we prepare for it, we put evidence on the table uh, in terms of uh, the new technologies that have emerged and new science that has emerged and, uh, you know, new policy, uh, you know, smart policies uh, that are, have actually, you know, been generated uh, in terms of uh, fertilizer subsidies, for example, uh, and uh, make sure that, uh, you know, that evidence is presented to African uh, governments. Uh, but beyond that, of course, uh, you know, we're already making a number of recommendations here uh, from this uh, gathering. Let's not look at that summit as a one-shot activity. Uh, it, it is critical that, uh, you know, uh, before we actually get to the summit in 2022, uh, there is a very robust engagement uh, at the national level. Um, you know, we, we make sure that our national governments are prepared to participate uh, in that summit by actually committing to certain critical uh, priorities, uh, whether it's in terms of uh, uh, ensuring that uh, they, they have a proper assessment, uh, you know, uh, of their own, you know, progress, the progress they've made, um, you know, th th that's going to be, you know, uh, critical as, as well. Uh, so there's a team of our IFDC and our Policy Research Institute that are looking into how based can we really ensure that uh, this summit is not just a, a talk shop, but uh, it is speaking to, you know, great strides that are already on the ground, uh, driven by, you know, the global research institutions, uh, including IFDC, driven by national research institutions, and we put that evidence on the table. Uh, if there are challenges, uh, as indicated, uh, mm -hmm. which are, are actually you know, facing national governments, let those be put on the table as well uh, in terms of shocking uh, you know, our leaders that uh, the onus is really upon them to invest uh, in soil health. The onus is upon them to train more uh, you know, uh, scientists. The onus is upon them to make sure that uh, they conserve you know, their soils. Uh, otherwise, this would actually, you know, lead towards a continued uh, poverty and food insecurity among these member states. Okay, can I carry on with uh, Dr. Kamara Umu? Um, would it be an opportunity um, to kind of prepare for the carbon markets for the African continent so that it's, it's agreed upon, let's say, during the summit uh, in 2022 or 23 when it will happen? Uh, or other options uh, that we can prepare for um, to, uh, well, to reap the international dynamics of uh, funding mechanisms or otherwise? I, I think um, Dr. Lal, it would be very good to have Dr. Lal um, in the working groups of the summit so he can build on that concept. Um, I don't know if he's already engaged in that process uh, with Dr. Wakadawiri, um, but I think um, he has had strong perspectives on how to make this work on the continent, and it will be critical that he, uh, he leads the preparation of inputs into the summit in this area. Okay, thank you very much. I, I saw uh, David's hand. Is that correct? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well, David. Yeah, um, well, great discussion. I think a lot of very good uh, points have been made. I just wanted to uh, raise the attention that at the direction of the AUC, there is a group of uh, African agencies that they call themselves the X pillar four agencies, the FARA and, and the sub-regional research organizations and AFAS, the African uh, Extension Network, are uh, with their leadership, a working group is preparing uh, a, a document to be um, a sort of a programmatic document called the Soil Initiative for Africa, which is trying to have take a rather holistic approach to the to the issue of soil health uh, 
including fertilizer, but beyond fertilizer and some of the direct, what directions that have been suggested by speakers today. So there is, there is an African um, uh, uh, working group putting together an African initiative on how to begin addressing all of the uh, uh, challenges that have been raised today and using many of the suggestions that have been made today. Um, I think that will, I'm not sure when that will become sort of a publicly discussed document, but it's in the works. Very good. Thank you, uh, David, for that. It would be good that we stay in touch. Um, so let's follow up on that as well. Um, very important to have these groups working on such topics. Okay. Do we have uh, anybody else? We still have some four minutes left, three minutes left. Um, I would like to um, inform you that uh, the recording will be shared of this uh, session and some additional information and resources that we uh, that we'll put together um, so you know uh, that you can listen to this again. Um, any final question or burning issues that somebody would like to raise? If uh, not, then uh, well, I'll, I'll take the liberty uh, to uh, to close off our uh, our I think very intriguing discussion. It's clearly a very important discussion. Uh, the African continent is facing some serious challenges, um, but uh, there are many opportunities. I think we identified several how we could collectively uh, support uh, the development of the agriculture sector. Um, um, we have had several suggestions on actions. We have had several suggestions on how to contribute to the upcoming African Union uh, summit. Um, we have had suggestions on policy measures, on involvement of private sector. Um, I think the discussion on the fact that the farmer is not the sole responsible for maintaining soil health uh, is a very important discussion uh, to carry forward and to see how we can collectively support it. Uh, the discussion on the fact that there are global dialogues on food systems and agricultural production systems that may not be suited for the African continent is an important one to carry forward and make sure that our donors understand all that and tune their uh, initiatives and activities uh, to suit the African uh, continent. Um, it's not a complete summary. Uh, it will be very difficult to do. Um, but um, I think uh, the discussion was very fruitful for me at least. Learned a lot of things. I hope it was valuable for you as well. Uh, please stay in touch, uh, stay engaged. We will share the information and we will follow up. Um, um, and I wish you a great day uh, today. Thank you for your time, uh, an hour and a half almost. Um, and I hope you had enjoyed it. Um, if there is uh, if somebody from our panel, Umu or Richard, who wants to say a last word, then we will uh, close off. David, Dr. Ram, just to say, you know, thank you very much to everybody. I mean, I think uh, it is important that we appreciate that uh, this is not just an African uh, challenge, but this is a, a, a global challenge as well. We are all interconnected and uh, would like to call upon the global community to join efforts with uh, initiatives that are on the ground in Africa and uh, from Africa side as institutions of uh, research uh, would like to call upon global research institutions to join hands with us. Uh, in uh, unearthing some of these uh, challenges as indeed and indeed opportunities that uh, have been, uh, you know, uh, put, put uh, on the table today and uh, which uh, we can, uh, you know, make sure that they're operationalized by our leaders. But more than that, uh, it's about persuading uh, our African leaders uh, to commit uh, investments uh, in uh, this particular space. Sir Hearth, thank you. Thank you. Uh, David, did you raise your hand? No? Okay, uh, then I, I, I will now really close off. Thank you everybody uh, for, uh, for this very uh, discussion, uh, important discussions, and we'll take it from here on. Have a nice day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Prem, and everybody.